Politics, it's now time to take a look at news stories making headlines around the globe. United States President Joe Biden has pressed Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to implement, and I quote, specific, concrete and measurable, in these words, steps to protect civilians and aid workers in Gaza. The White House said at a phone call between the two leaders, Biden, in his strongest public rebuke toward Israel since the start of its war with Hamas, told the Israeli Prime Minister that the overall humanitarian situation in Gaza is unacceptable, warning that American policy on Gaza will be determined by whether Israel takes steps to address the safety of Palestinian civilians and aid workers, a stark statement from Israel's staunchest ally. White House National Security Advisor John Kirby says if Israel does not change how it is carrying out its war in Gaza, the U.S. will change its policy toward Israel. As I'm sure you're all aware, the president had a chance to speak with Prime Minister Netanyahu earlier uh, today. On that phone call, the president emphasized that the strikes on humanitarian workers and the overall humanitarian situation in Gaza are unacceptable. He made clear the need for Israel to announce and to implement a series of specific, concrete, and measurable steps to address civilian harm, humanitarian suffering, and the safety of aid workers. He made clear that U.S. policy with respect to Gaza will be determined by our assessment of Israel's immediate action on these steps. He underscored that an immediate ceasefire is essential to stabilize and improve the humanitarian situation and to protect innocent civilians. And he urged the Prime Minister to empower his negotiators to conclude a deal without delay to bring the hostages home. The two leaders also discussed public Iranian threats against Israel and the Israeli people. President Biden made clear that the United States strongly supports Israel in the face of those threats. That's all I have. I'm not going to preview um, uh, any potential policy decisions coming forward. Um, uh, what we want to see are some real changes uh, on the Israeli side. Um, and, um, you know, if we don't see changes from their side, there'll have to be changes from our side. But I won't preview what that could look like. Now, as, in terms of concrete steps, uh, what we are uh, looking to see and, and hope to see here uh, in coming hours and days is uh, a dramatic increase in the humanitarian assistance getting in, additional crossings opened up, uh, and a, um, a reduction in the violence against uh, civilians and certainly aid workers. We want to uh, we want to see that uh, that uh, even as the Israelis work through their investigation that they are willing and able to take practical immediate steps to protect aid workers on the ground and to demonstrate uh, that they that they have that civilian harm mitigation in place. So again, those are broad brushes. I'll let the Israelis speak to what they will or won't do here. But again, in coming hours and days, we will be looking for concrete, tangible steps that they're taking. All right, there we have John Kirby uh, giving updates from that phone call. It looks like uh, President Joe Biden has been busy with phone calls this week, hasn't he? Earlier on, we've spoken about his call with uh, Premier, Chinese Premier Xi Jinping, and now a very important one with Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. Before yes, I take. Uh, the Americans are busy with their hypocritical phone calls as regards Israel. And I say hypocritical phone calls is because you're threatening now that if you don't increase your humanitarian corridor, you have stiffer measures, but you're still giving a lot of aid as regards to military weapons to the Israelis to be able to destroy and decimate people in Gaza. The other day, I think the IDF came out to say that about 12,000 people have been killed, but that masks the real number of over 20,000 Gazans that have been killed and the killing still goes on. America has shown a great level of hypocrisy. All of this Joe Biden is now doing is not in a bid to be sanctimonious because he has seen on ground that there's a ground swell in America as regards the atrocities happening out there. And it might affect election prospects. What are the Americans doing about right-wing people in America that are saying, don't even spend more on bombing Gaza. Have a nuclear weapon to take out Gaza. That killing was needless. The assault on the people at the humanitarian kitchen different assaults that have happened. We've been pushing for a ceasefire all this while we cannot get it. Because at the same time, America says something, but on the other side, it cannot stand by it because of lobby group and interest groups. 
can I use the word the deep state? So it's another sh- level of sheer hypocrisy as with Joe Biden and the things he has said. Because, I mean, I don't trust what Joe Biden says with due respect. This was the same Joe Biden that said, we'll have a ceasefire in about a week till the other time. Where is the ceasefire? Netanyahu is playing his hardball and he's playing it right because the special interest out of America that constantly supports this war let the war machinery go on. So the American government can say something as have telephone calls, but it doesn't solve the situation. But in this conflict, we will always celebrate people that stood up for justice. South Africa stood up to be counted. And that's why when there was a resolution by the South Africans at the International Parliamentary Union, as regards meeting with the towns of the ISJC, reminding Israel of the two-state solution, forcing them to come to the table in consonance with the IJC rules and regulations, opening up a humanitarian path, which the Africans and the Arabs all came together to vote for. I don't know why Nigeria did not vote for that. We followed a lesser Danish proposition that just says call for humanitarian and are not in accordance with the laws of this country. So we should ask ourselves questions. Do we want this American hypocrisy to continue? You say one thing, you mean the other thing, you issue threats. I dare America. If Netanyahu does not agree to those increasing humanitarian corridors, what would you do to him? You wouldn't do anything to him. Let's call it speed is speed. Okay, let me address the subject of hypocrisy in international law. In situations like this, Israel versus Hamas or any other conflict, the enabling law is Article 3 of the 19. 19- uh, 49 uh, Geneva Convention. Article 3, which is a common element uh, under international humanitarian law, addresses what we're dealing with. It says, for example, that in the situation of armed conflict, non-combatants must be protected. It says there must be access to humanitarian aid. It says that there should be the prohibition of the use of certain categories of weapons. The general principles governing armed conflict also include proportionality in terms of response. In all of these respects, Israel appears to have violated international law, it appears to have inv- violated international obligations and conventions to which it is a signatory. Now, what is the international community doing in response? The West has clearly been hypocritical. And that is why we found that up and down, you know, at the United Nations Security Council in terms of, you know, arriving even at a resolution. The Americans came forward with a, 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 a proposal for ceasefire. First, they were talking about cessation of hostilities. Then they moved to a ceasefire. Then they changed the language to immediate ceasefire. And then they made release of hostages a condition. And that was rejected. It was vetoed by Russia and China. At the end of the day, the non-permanent members came together and passed the resolution that eventually was endorsed by 14 members with, you know, uh, the United States abstaining and with no veto. So that gives you an idea of the hypocrisy. And as it is with the United States, so it is with the UK. Two days ago, 600 lawyers, including King's Council, wrote to the Prime Minister to say that, look, UK should stop selling arms to, the, uh, to Israel to show its objection uh, to the humanitarian crisis in Gaza and uh, Israel's continued violation of international law. Now, the, uh, the uh, number 10, Downing Street, just uh, you know, uh, more or less uh, ignored it and made statements about cessation of hostilities. As of this morning, Tory backbenchers, Many of them are also saying that the prime minister should publish legal opinion uh, that had been submitted to it as to whether or not Israel had violated international law. And then you'll find that again on the part of uh, the Americans. The phone call yesterday between Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu lasted less than 30 minutes. Now he said that there will be consequences, according to John Kerry, uh, spokesman, national security uh, spokesperson. Now, what are those consequences? Those consequences were not defined. 
The United States says it is asking for specific, concrete, and measurable measures to be taken by Israel. The nature, the nature of what the uh, uh, U.S. is asking for was not properly defined by President Biden. Number three, the Americans are saying that, oh, you know, uh, U.S. policy on uh, Gaza will be determined by the steps taken by uh, uh, Israel. Okay, what are those steps that Israel will take? After the attack on the uh, uh, World Central Kitchen uh, uh, workers, seven of them, the U.S. has refused to condemn it. They are towing the line of Netanyahu, who is saying that uh, these things happen in war, and that in any case, if it happens, we will take measures uh, not to, uh, uh, that it will not uh, happen again. The U.S. has refused to condemn that killing. Instead, the U.S. is asking Israel to investigate and ensure accountability. You are asking Israel to investigate something in which it was the aggressor. So this is another example of the hypocrisy that we talk about. Meanwhile, Andre, the founder of the World Central Kitchen, has said the attack on the convoy was systematic from car to car. So, you know, this is uh, clear evidence of, uh, uh, you know, how the Americans have been hypocritical in this matter. Meanwhile, only in recent weeks, America has supplied more arms to Israel. In UK, the demand also is that Britain should stop giving arms to Israel after Israel has killed uh, three uh, uh, British soldiers who were working for World Central Kitchen. Number 10 is also dilly-dallying over it. They, they cannot come forward. Now, to go to the second point about politics, you recall that during the State of the Union address and during the Democratic primaries, President uh, Biden was opposed by voters, by activist voters, you know, in Wisconsin, the most recent, in Connecticut, in Michigan, in Rhode Island. Not necessarily because they will not vote for him as the Democratic candidate, but to send a message that they object very strongly to Biden administration support for Israel. And President Biden, even in that phone call, in the readout that has been reported, exposed America's position when, one, he refused to condemn the attack on the uh, convoy, two, he refused to hold Israel responsible, and he was saying that America's position with regard to Israel's right to defend itself, to self-defense, has not changed. And that on the question of Iran, America is solidly behind uh, Israel. So what exactly is uh, President Biden saying other than rhetorical packaging? It's just rhetorical packaging for the purposes of election. Now he has sent a signal to the average American voter that the Biden administration is rebuking uh, uh, Netanyahu. Netanyahu will not listen. In 2022, the Israelis, they killed, uh, was it an American uh, journalist? The Americans uh, asked for accountability. Which accountability did they get? So it's all about politics. It's all about violations of international law and part of the crisis, you know, experiencing uh, uh, the regime of international humanitarian law is the inability of the relevant organs, international organs, to enforce their own resolutions and to enforce the law. Clear violations of the 1949 Geneva uh, uh, Convention, clear violations of United Nations Security Council resolution, clear violations of the International Court of Justice legally binding but unenforceable declaration on Israel's activities in Gaza. This is the reality of the world in which we live. All right, still um, furthermore on um, hypocrisy. Of course, as had already been mentioned, this phone call came on the heels of the unfortunate deaths of seven humanitarian workers from the World Central Kitchen and uh, this brings to about 200 humanitarian workers who have been killed since October when the conflict started. 
And according to reports, like Dr. Bati had mentioned, not just the president of World Central Kitchen, but the parents of one of the victims, one of the deceased, came out to say that, according to their reports and interviews they'd done, that it was, a, it was a targeted attack by Israel. It wasn't a mistake, according to what Israel is posing to say, or oh, they regret such an unfortunate incident and they will um, institute an investigation into this. Now, beyond that, Food, or shall I say starvation, has been used as a weapon of war for many years, for as long as you can imagine. And the U.S. in, in August of 2023 led a joint communique alongside 91 member countries of the United Nations to sign a communique condemning the use of food or starvation as a weapon of war. And guess who's also a signatory to that communique? Israel is a signature to that communique. Now, if you look at the war of Israel against Hamas, you would see how systematically food or starvation has been used as a powerful weapon of war, almost as powerful as throwing bombs, especially when corridors in which inroads into um, Palestine or the Gaza Strip are closed or blocked by Israel. And now, where it seems like aid workers or humanitarians are targeted, uh, allegedly, by Israel. This is a huge issue, and this is where perhaps Biden has come out to say that okay, they're putting their food for um, um, they're putting a, a strong um, sense of censure against Israel. However, the big question for a number of people is that to what extent will this censure go? To what extent, or how far will this phone call go? Would Netanyahu, uh, Netanyahu listen? Well, according to initial reports, uh, it looks like there's been some sort of capitulation, even in its smallest sense. So, the, for the first time since October last year when the conflict started. The Erez border, which um, the Israel border between the north of Gaza has been opened um, between the phone call and now. So that's one light in the tunnel, but still a little drop in the ocean when it comes to the bigger picture. What would see in the coming days as to whether or not Netanyahu would, you know, any phone, if there was any merit to that phone call, would be how far the corridors would be open and to what extent they would allow aid workers to go into some parts of Gaza Strip, particularly the north that have been deprived of aid and a number of people have described it as as a dire situation where it's famine, hunger, and the important thing is that it is civilians. And when it comes to war, there's always the conversation about the civilians and ensuring that aid reaches them and are protected. This is the grounds for a number of countries who had for a long time been allies or supporters of Israel in terms of how Benjamin Netanyahu have, has hand, had handled this war. Now, the big thing is that, as I had already mentioned, for Joe Biden, it's a political situation now because it could potentially, potentially cost him the elections in November because the number of progressives and Arab Americans are outraged by the war and are going against him for his support. America and U.S. have been strong allies for years. And so their policy direction in this instance has not been to move away in terms of support. Like you mentioned, Rufai, they've just released about 2,000, um, approved 2,000 um, weapons to go to Israel in the last few days and a few other things. So they are not backing down in that regard. But what they're saying is that they're going to come, out, come down hard if Netanyahu does not respect um, you know, the, the rules of engagement, especially when it comes to war and the role of civilians. On the other side, finally, Netanyahu is trying to stave off an election because he would potentially lose if an election is called. And so a number of um, um, watchers have said that perhaps this war favors him in such a way that he wouldn't want to call a ceasefire so that there's no room to conduct an election where he could potentially lose. There's also the conversation around his closeness, recent closeness to Republicans in the United States of America. So it's quite dicey. There's a political angle to this, as with a number of wars, as with many wars you know, around the world. But it, it, we, would, we would see to what extent Israel would respect some of the, um, it, what it signed on to with the United Nations, some of the agreements, communiques, especially against using hunger and starvation as a weapon of war and other things. Too early to call, but hopefully this might be the turning point for the war between Israel and Hamas. Move on to our next story. Nigeria's president, Bola Tinubu, has affirmed his commitment to collaborating with the private sector, recognizing its pivotal role in the nation's economy. During a Ramadan fast-breaking gathering with business leaders at the Aso Rock Villa, Tinubu promised to fulfill his mandate and emphasized the importance of working closely with the private sector for economic transformation. State House correspondent Adesua Omoran reports. Amit fine dining and humor. When you're going to have dinner with Mr. President, you go and wear your vest. This is my vest. <laughs> 
<laughs> President Bola Tinubu's Ramadan breaking of fast today sees a distinguished gathering of Nigeria's business elite, creating the perfect ambience for feasts of economic ideas. There is no driver of this economy other than you, what you are. If the private sector is not flourishing, there is no growth, there is no prosperity, there is no employment. No matter how flowery the speeches are, it won't grow any mushroom. Drawing from his visit to the New York Stock Exchange, President Chinu echoed his conviction that Nigeria can drive economic transformation from within. We only want you to show your face as a diversified and understanding bold investors. Not we cannot do it ourselves. I said, we, we can do it. Nigeria is a self-believer and can always deliver on its own. Whatever, you know, they call us in the past, we know our first name and our last name. Our first name is Spirit, our last name is Kandu. Tanubu's words weren't just food for thought. The way I call to action, urging collaboration. You voluntarily elected me. I campaigned for it. I got it. I have no excuse but perform. Say, I can't complain. That is stressful. There are some countries that have failed. There are some countries that have succeeded. But in your time, in our time, in my time, all of us must work together to succeed. On their part, Nigeria's business titans restated their commitment to supporting the administration's economic programs, offering a banquet of ideas and resources. Mr. President, on behalf of the Nigerian private sector, I wish to assure you that we are 101 percent behind. There are some industries that can do much better. My industry, I think our president is can do much, much better. Pharmaceutical industry in Nigeria can do better if supported. And we need to uh, have a forum that we can say this is how we can be supported. I'm encouraged by the few things that you have done since you assumed office. The signals that you have set and the fact that you know you are communicating with your people. I mean, we had eight years of where I thought there was a complete blank, you know, no communication. Okay. But it's not just about words. Actions speak volumes. Alan Oyema, Chief Executive Officer of Air Peace, emphasizes the importance of tangible results. The ease of doing business is coming back gradually. I can attest to that. The leadership you appointed in education, I know what they did. I know what they did recently. You know, when some civil servant decided to disappear, they stood their ground and said, this will never happen again. Look at what the High Commission in the UK did. They spread a piece on screens all over London. Everybody felt belonged. You've proved that you are a Nigerian president. You're not a Nigerian president. Don't get me on. Nigerians will be clapping. They will say, oh, the bridge away is virtually 15, 16, 15 million, 10 million, a piece is cheaper. No. We have to think of the country first. I decided to bring it down to 4 million. And we're not losing by even doing 4 million, Your Excellency. The main high fares that we are charging on the dollar, they made the government look bad to my brothers and sisters at the private sector. Think of what you can do to support him. The only way you can support him is to go to your businesses and try to see how you can bring down the cost of your products 
When you do that, it trickles back to the government and people will continue to believe in the government. I've done my part. God bless you. As the event concludes, there's a palpable sense of optimism and determination. There was a lot of uh, apprehension. They were not very happy and very uncertain. But the vibe we're getting right now in the room is totally different from what we got when we first started. The assurances that we've heard in this room is, is um, to be honest, very gladdening. And that shows the amount of work that Your Excellency, you've done and the amount of belief that the community has in your mission. Adesua, Omoruan, Arise News. I have to say that this news delights me this morning, mm -hmm. Rufai. Uh, the president meeting with the organized private sector and seeing some key players. And of course, very wonderful to see the gender <coughs> parity in the room and those who were able to speak. But very importantly, of course, are some of the details of what's come out and hopefully the outcome of this meeting. Your take on this story. I mean, I'm very excited. So <coughs> I must give commendation to the president. He's used this as Ramadan breaking of fast to be able to target various sectors of the economy, which is very good. And that's why it's constantly been a newsmaker, where he targets one sector and says, OK, let's talk about this. And they talk about issues like that. This time is for the businesses. Yes. Uh, we see an upscale as regards things. And this was enunciated. I mean, Alan Oyema was here to talk about the stellar role Festus Kiyama played. And this morning, I'll single Festus Kiyama out for special praise yeah. as regards standing firm, you know, with Nigerian indigenous airlines to be able to get their message out there as regards, you know, fighting these other competitors that want to be an excess drain on our country. That's a commendable one. Also, I'm happy that you had, you know, a full on array of businesses, the pharmaceutical sector, for instance. I'm happy about, you know, Madam Mukoli being there, but a lot more still needs to be done. These are glowing things, but this is just the surface. The pharmaceutical sector, for instance, needs a lot of capital injection. I recently I was talking to somebody in the pharmaceutical sector that talked about the fact that cost of getting chemicals in for production and things like that have skyrocketed. And a lot of people are shutting production potentials. Madam Mokoli recently got a loan or an investment from um, what, what's it called? African Bank or uh, African Development Bank before you had the dollar surge. I'm happy the dollar is coming down now, but what do you do to be able to bring about stability? Because businesses need stability and hedge against the attendant problems we have in the sector. Cost of doing business is reducing, like Colonel Lima says, but when you check the ease of doing business charts, it's not reducing. We still have a large scale of inflation. From the February rump of increase in price, we are happy that things are coming down, but how can we reduce them even more? So I'm excited about this meeting. This is not the very first of it. How can we then now consolidate? And I'm also excited President Tinubu did bring some of these business leaders into his council. The likes of Innocent were there. What can we do for the other industry? I think President Tinubu should now go ahead and make a law that most public parastatals must drive Innocent, Nigerian makers, North and the likes. If they don't do that, then no show because we need to be able to develop internally. But that, that's the very best way to start. Dr. Mati. Okay, this is a fairly straight forward subject. The president, in the spirit of the season, has been holding iftar, the breaking of fast, with different segments of society. We have seen senators and other lawmakers, you know, visiting the villa. We have seen the judiciary. Now is the uh, organized uh, private uh, sector. And as has become characteristic, the uh, president used the opportunity of this meeting with leaders of the private sector. Um, to again deliver the message of hope, to say Nigeria will prosper. He talked about the can-do spirit. He talked about the fact that he has, he's not giving excuses. He campaigned for the job, and he's going to do the job and get it done. Give hope, fix uh, the economy, check inflation, create jobs, and all of those things you know, that he has been doing. So it was just an opportunity to reassure the uh, uh, business community and to ask for their cooperation. And one of the major points he made at that meeting is that other countries that appear to be doing very well didn't get there overnight. It took time. And it took time through perseverance, through focus, through hard work. So on the point, he said all the uh, 
relevant things. And he promised that he will create, provide consistently an enabling environment for business to thrive. I think that that's the uh, most important part of that conversation. However, in terms of uh, uh, representation, I, you know, I looked around the room from what I've seen on screen. Maybe it was the cameraman not covering the entire uh, list of persons there. I think maybe some key persons in the organized private sector were left out. I was particularly looking out for media chiefs. Uh, the media is part of organized uh, private sector. We are every day struggling with diesel, with electricity, with uh, other elements used in media production. Maybe that's an oversight. Maybe the president, uh, before Ida Fitri, we should be uh, in a few days' time, in about five, six days, yeah. we still organize to meet with the uh, media chiefs. And also meet, uh, more importantly, with senior journalists, who are also a very important part of this uh, uh, Nigerian equation. I would personally like to also go and breakfast. <laughs> it's been a while since uh, I ate uh, uh, Aso Villa delicacies. So there should be equity in these uh, invitations. What is good for the goose is good for the gander. And one on one, when we see the president, we, we have opinions, we have things to tell him. And that takes me to the next point. The uh, guests who were invited, you know, the ones that took the microphone, they all spoke very nicely. Where well, I don't expect that you will be sitting in front of a man, you'll be eating his food, and you'll be criticizing him. So there was a lot of courtesy, a lot of diplomacies. But the way we used to do this is that after that general open meeting, some members, some of the guests, we have an opportunity for a one-on-one -on -one with the president. I hope you know, the organizers you know, provided that opportunity for one-on-one. -on -one. For example, for uh, Mr. Allen Onyema uh, to, to tell the president clearly what he said on television here, that some civil servants at the uh, Motala Mohammed Airport, they, 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 on the maiden flight, they packed uh, Airpiece uh, maiden uh, uh, aircraft to London in the bush. And for the president to pay close attention to that kind of thing. Because, you know, there are Nigerians, the president is trying to do the best that he can for the business community. But there are some civil servants who are trying to sabotage the efforts of the government. The, such little, little details should be brought to the attention of the president. That next time anybody packs a airpiece in the bush, that person should, should lose his job. And there should be proper, you know, organization in terms of how we encourage Nigerian businesses. And it's not just EPIs, that goes down the line. Government cannot be saying it wants to encourage business and some elements within the system who don't even understand the vision of the administration will be trying to frustrate the system. I, well, if there was that one-on-one, uh, -on -one, they should try to pay attention to those details. All right, well, Dr. Bate, like Dr. Stella Okoli mentioned, perhaps start getting ready your best suit for that presidential invitation. No, it's Agbada. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, Agbada, oh, my, my, my apologies, <laughs> Agbada. The worst suit from Monday through to oh, Friday. Oh, Agbada. Yeah, Agbada. All right, very... No, it's familiar territory. I don't need to dress specially to go to the villa. <laughs> what would you be wearing? <laughs> yeah, you know, we'll talk about outfits later. Later. I mentioned that obviously because she had men said that oh she wore her best outfit to come you know for the for the dinner of waking up fast with the president. I was going to start by saying can do spirit can do as he mentioned first name spirit last name can do. Yes, that is Have this can do yeah can do spirit and, that, and that's so fantastic because spirit can do. But that's so fantastic in terms of what we're hearing. Say what you may, but you cannot fault in terms of messaging and this consistency. <laughs> in saying that he asked for the job, he will not complain, he's working to ensure that he's taking the economy to the right direction. We can have a bigger conversation around whether or not his actions have been in line with what he's hoping to do in terms of taking the economy to the right direction. But what in the immediate sense we can praise, like Mrs. Ms. Amina Oyagwala of Wiska, they had mentioned, that previous administrations didn't even have the conversations with the organized private sector. So already this is one win for this administration. The fact that they are willing to open up to dialogue, to conversations, to bringing men and women to the table, 
who are, as he mentioned, key drivers of the economy, the private sector. So he cannot talk about economic development without engaging members of the organized private sector. And Mr. Tony Olimelu had mentioned, talked about the fact that they were supporting him and behind him. And the truth is, as had already been said, leadership can be very lonely, can be full of criticism, and there are many, let me use the word on the street, haters. And so you need some allies, you need some people to speak up even when things are very hot, in the same way that you need people who will criticize constructively some policies so that we can bring about changes, criticism, constructive criticism, and feedback that possibly made the student loan go back to the house for a reenactment and a repayment. So, so a number of things to have conversations around, and I'm really excited and hopeful, let me use the word hopeful, for what will come for this administration. At the end of the day, all we want or what we desire is for a Nigeria that works for the benefit of every single Nigerian. Move on to other news making the rounds this morning. President Bola Tinubu has called on Gavi the Vaccine Alliance, to collaborate with potential Nigerian vaccine manufacturers to ensure equitable access to life-saving vaccines for children and adults. The Naira yesterday continued to gain against the dollar at the official window while it maintained stability at the parallel markets. The Naira closed at 1,255.07 Naira to the dollar, a gain from its previous close at 1,262.85 Naira to the dollar on Wednesday, reflecting a gain of 7 Naira 78 Kobo. On the foreign scene, Israel says it has approved the opening of two humanitarian routes into Gaza to allow more aid into the territory. Also, Japan's Nikkei share average tumbled more than 2% to a three-week low on Friday putting it on course for its worst week since December 2022 as tech shares slid on Wall Street's lead. And that's it on the news at this time.